introduce uh, V. Great. Um, um, so my name is Vina, um, and I work at um, LinkedIn. I've um, been working since um, two years. Um, so um, I work at, uh, I'll be talking about, it's kind of an odd topic, but I think through the presentation you'll realize which basically I'm um, trying to come away. Um, so we, um, I'm part of a team called Pi, which is a, a, a short name for uh, presentation infrastructure. Uh, we uh, own the infrastructure for front end, um, the web and, the, and, and, and partly um, evolving into how we use um, the same thing in mobile. Um, it, it's a big group, and I was one other team member here, Jonathan, so um, just one uh, member of that. Um, I think it's seven or eight of us at this point. Uh, so we handle the uh, infrastructure, front end, JavaScript, um, the SaaS stuff that we use for CSS, and a lot of the mobile uh, thing that we're doing um, down the line will be handled by us. So I think this is what I was trying to say. So we basically do um, handle all of the front end infrastructure uh, thing. So just to start with, um, I'm just going to little, uh, tell a story about what was LinkedIn's legacy or LinkedIn's history with uh, web application development. Um, my talk may not be as um, entertaining as the previous uh, person who um, was you know, delving into what's the way of the front end, but for LinkedIn, it was uh, certainly something that they had to you know, think through in the last one year as to what the front end development uh, needs to evolve um, because um, it's been, they're almost like eight years, and when it started, um, I don't think uh, we had so many new technologies, and, and mobile was not even in the, in the picture. Uh, so when LinkedIn is growing, and uh, I think when IPO in 2010, um, there's, a, there's a huge uh, a set of questions we had to answer. And, and our team kind of is trying to answer how quickly we develop an iTrade and, and develop these um, you know, great ideas that we have with the LinkedIn data that we've accumulated. So the story was basically this, um, you know, um, there was a company and then it had to go IPO. I mean, um, means you have your site up and running. So our team was basically responsible for the scalability part of our front ends. Um, we have a lot of um, front end features, maybe none of them, you know, not many people if you use it, but we get a lot of traffic. And we have a recruiter product which brings in a lot of money for us. And that's one of the, you know, important um, um, uh, front-end um, sites that we always have to keep up and running. So I think first objective that when I started two years was basically scaling, scaling to the ever-growing traffic. Um, and we traditionally have been the Java stack. LinkedIn's since six years is um, it used JVM all the way from top to bottom. And I think scaling was easy. Um, we built a lot of uh, good infrastructure for like parallel assembly and, and, and making um, our um, service call times really parallel and faster. Alongside, I think we also picked up on the site speed and, and, and we wanted to have, uh, we were, we were um, getting traffic outside of US and usually inside of US our you know, site speed performance has been pretty good. But when we go to like countries outside of, uh, in, uh, of US, I think uh, site speed mattered to us. Um, I think three years are uh, sometimes like our homepage and the LinkedIn profile page is loaded at around uh, three seconds or four seconds. And uh, some of the objectives was to get all of that down. So, so this, this was pretty much what the infrastructure team um, was focusing on. Scaling, uh, keeping the site up and running, and um, keeping the site really fast. So what's the problem? I mean, looks, everything is great. Um, I think partly uh, we use uh, agents um, like Keynote to kind of measure, and also I think they develop our own um, uh, internal uh, uh, user-based performance monitoring. We have a beacon on the page that collects samples of page load times um, for 10% of the users, um, and that's where we kind of track how bad the end-to-end -end performance is. Um, so that includes both the client load and the, the JavaScript as well as the server performance. So, 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 so where is the problem? And everything looks good for us, and, and you might be wondering, uh, what is this talk related to? So the problem was basically since, uh, since a year and a half, um, since we went IPO, I think everyone knows it comes with a lot of money. So the, so the company is growing, and I think we're um, hiring a lot of people. Uh, a lot of people means, um, I mean, we have good ideas, we have great product ideas to build, and um, that means your front end, systems and the infrastructure that you support needs to scale not just to the site, you have to scale it to the engineers. It needs to be intuitive to use, it needs to be quick to iterate on. 
Um, and there should be less of interdependencies between the back end and the front end. Uh, we really don't want um, um, the, the technologies to slow down um, the, uh, you know, the iteration that these really young, smart people that are joining LinkedIn. So this, this is the thing. So site scale and site speed are very implicit at this point for us. Whatever we do, whatever technology we embrace, and the things that we're doing, um, I'll talk about. Site speed and site scaling is implicit. And I think one of our major focus uh, in LinkedIn in, the, in, in our team is, whatever we do, uh, how does it really help us uh, you know, increase developer velocity or you know, developer productivity? Every engineer uh, needs to have to you know, iterate quicker. So some of, some of the goals of our, um, our, 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 of our um, team basically is, you know, there are a lot of open source frameworks. You know, you know, a lot of people who come into LinkedIn have worked in Python, they worked in Django, or they worked in Rails. Um, they worked in all of these cool things that are great for startups. And, and they're great for companies who have just started like a couple of years back or like two or three years back, and they embrace all these cool things. And it's, those, those frameworks are easy to iterate on. I mean, and, and, and they, they can build stuff. But I think getting to that concentric circle of where you have site scale, uses, use, uses framework that actually scales, and you, know, you also do you know, good performance, and as well give them a tool to develop really, really fast, is, 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 is not an easy uh, goal. I mean, it's, and, and I'll talk about that why. But underlying, I think, whatever we come up with, and, and I'm going back to the talk the previous presenter said, I think we don't have to over-engineer um, um, a system, you know, simple things to develop a simple web page, to develop a simple feature, um, to develop, you know, a LinkedIn profile and add a few features. It should be simple. Um, you shouldn't be, um, you know, um, under, need to understand um, a lot of the proprietary LinkedIn stuff or a lot of the proprietary LinkedIn, um, you know, um, frameworks we have. So, so the goal was this. These are two goals: help them build quickly and help them iterate faster. Um, and the LinkedIn history of, um, I think, six years, there's been so much proprietary uh, stuff. We have our own um, you know, uh, LinkedIn framework uh, for developing frontends, um, which is very surprising to many people when they come in. And even the term JSPs is not really like the standard JSPs. We used to use our own LinkedIn JSPs. Um, so every web, web developer who came in or every frontend engineer who came in was excited about the scale and the impact that they can have on LinkedIn. And then the second day they see there's so much stuff to learn. Um, there's so much stuff that no one knows about. It's all buried in like the heads of a few people in the company. So, so those were some of the things that um, you know we were tackling. And and then the fact that we used Java heavily, uh, it was kind of convenient for um, LinkedIn to even have a front end in Java. But I mean, the downsides of it being it's not a dynamic language, and then you know every time you write some code, you have to redeploy and build, and the whole process was slower. So, so we started thinking about, you know, how can we improve that? And the big debate started, you know, why, why don't we move into, you know, dynamic languages? So this is the next step that evolved into, right? We ended up having a languages like JRuby to build, to do front ends. Because we still want to do uh, JVM, the fact that it can scale, and, and we already have infrastructure support to do that. Um, then um, there were teams that uh, kind of started getting grails, and, and because it's dynamic and you can iterate. The Bumble team um, started using the node, and we use that. Um, so this switch was good, you know, every team kind of iterates in their own pace using the kind of language that they want to, they build front ends, and, and it looks great, it's a great story. Um, but did anyone see a um, bad pattern here? At least for the company or for an infrastructure team? Exactly. Um, it's, it's, it's even worse than that, you know, you like, a team does the same thing once, twice, thrice, it just goes on. And tomorrow there's a Mysterio framework that might come along, um, you know, which we don't know, it might be the awesomest thing, um, some, something that I just saw in the morning, the Meteor thing, and the company wants to just use it. I mean, there may be two people who join the company who want to just use that. So it's good to, you know, it's, it's easier to kind of iterate with these really cooler things, but I think you also need to, uh, uh, for, for a company such as LinkedIn, that you need to scale and make sure that it scales to the 160 million users that we have down the line and all the mobile traffic. It's, it's not like an easy switch. So all of these things that we started doing with JRuby and Grails and Node, um, I mean, there were certain applications. Um, uh, I mean, one of the goals of LinkedIn has been to go mobile, and then, I mean, that's probably going to go with a lot of companies, is, you know, you develop once for both the web and the mobile. I mean, you don't try to do it for mobile once and then mobile once. So all of this that we'll be doing was not even fitting into our um, future goals of, like, 
how can we iterate fast but also develop to different environments? And another thing that we've noticed with using JSPs or like using Ruby apps or like the JRuby uh, apps or the Grails is like we were doing and repeating a lot of things again and again. Um, one team builds a component in, in Grails using GSPs and somebody wants another, the same thing, but they can't because you know, across these languages, you really can't use these templating languages. Um, and that's where we really started thinking hard. Um, even like some of the, you won't believe we had JRuby apps embedding JSPs. So that's the bleeding edge we went into where in order to just reuse some of our infrastructure, we had one uh, you know, app embedding views of the other. Um, that means a lot of infrastructure support had to be done. We don't know if it's, you know, it's going to like continue to do and how much we can gain from it. And the bottom line is I think we were to send out to solve one problem of like productive, uh, product, uh, productivity or velocity for the developer and I think we created more problems, much more um, difficult for the company in the long run to handle. Because if you roll out one new front end feature, you have to do it like across all these stacks. Um, and, and, and isolating them into one is, is never, never um, easy. So, and that's where I think in the last uh, year, uh, we, uh, as part of the PI team, we focused on a little bit of what we did. And uh, to us, I think it was not that we wanted to reinvent the wheel and come up with um, a new solution. All we had to do was sit and then look what everybody else was doing and kind of get the best of what we uh, think suits LinkedIn. Um, so. This is what we ended up unifying our stack. Um, at the end of the day, in, in the last one year, we have built a lot of infrastructure support. So the first thing was basically, um, you know, let's unify the views. Uh, we let's not use JSPs and ERBs and GSPs, and we can we can we can let people use their own um, a front end stack because there are a lot of applications that they build, and the migration is not a goal for everyone. Um, you know, you want to get the business rolling, so. The idea was at least there are very lightweight JavaScript templates, and, and that's where we think um, um, all of the, that's where the real, you know, the reason we ended up moving to uh, JavaScript templates. And I think we did a tons of evaluation on the tons of templating languages that are there, and it didn't seem like we had to write another one. Um, so I'll just talk a little bit more in the next few slides on what we chose. And the biggest benefit of these things has been the fact that these templates are CD and cacheable. And that's a great site speed benefit for us too. Um, we have quite a bit of heavy pages. I mean, um, as I said, the regular app that we actually um, uh, is pretty prominently used in all the LinkedIn profiles that we get quite a lot of traffic every day. They're pretty heavy pages. Um, and the idea was you move to JavaScript, you render them on the client. Um, and the, the reason why I say write once is the JavaScript templates also have a beauty of you can render them on the server if you have infrastructure for them on the server. You can run a JavaScript engine on the server, um, something like Node or something like V8 and you can actually reuse the same template to either render on the client or on the server. Um, I think Twitter just came about that and then it calls it the conditional tier rendering. I mean, that's probably the new lingo. And that's what we, we adopted. I mean, because there are cases even in like um, uh, the profile, there are SEO pages in your LinkedIn profile that have to be kind of rendered on the server. But we end up writing them only once in these JavaScript templates. Um, so people now don't anymore write proprietary LinkedIn JSPs or proprietary um, you know, views of LinkedIn. They just use um, these templates. The second important thing I think was uh, more than the JavaScript templating for us, uh, we standardized on having JSON as the data transfer protocol and not HTML. So tomorrow if we want to migrate to a new, you know, as I said, a, a new app that um, um, is faster to iterate and develop on, Although we need is to send JSON from it, and then we can still continue to kind of use our existing templates. So, so we can plug and play. So we are not tied to a particular thing like Rails or Node or you know Grails or anything like that. So it's basically one standard. And, and the biggest, uh, another biggest thing is like in front of all these frontends, we have an evented uh, server that gives us the performance that we need. So it's kind of a UI or a JSON aggregator. Um, basically, sits talks to a bunch of apps and gets JSON from different uh, apps and then um, uh, you know, renders the page. The fact that it's evented gives us a great performance boost in terms of you know, out of order rendering and able to kind of uh, control what pieces of page can be dropped, kind of gracefully degrade. So these are some of the things that really help us um, in achieving what we want from performance. Um, and again, you just have to scale this one system and I think you know, it's, it's easy to do. So, so none of the JRuby apps or um, the Grails app or even the, the old Java apps that we have have to worry about these things. 
So a little bit about JavaScript templates. As I said, well, there's so many of them. I think we have already around 26. Um, all basically two, big, two or three big categories. One of them fall into the logic class, I think. A lot of people have talked in the beginning in, in, in this team of mustache and handlebars. And there's another thing we actually um, came about during that time called Dust that we use in LinkedIn today. It's very similar to handlebars um, and uh, gives you a great performance. We have performance tested and we've been using it in LinkedIn and some of the pages. And it's great because it, it's, it's, and it's pure JavaScript. It's a template that's converted into pure JavaScript on, uh, at build time, and then it, it allows us to really get good performance. And I think the, the, the good, goods of these templating languages, as I told you, is that it's, it's less logic. Um, we don't really believe in logicless, actually, but we chose this, and, and, I, and I, I, I can debate about it. Um, and I know the previous presenter was like, you know, handlebars like basically screwed up the must trash logicless thing. But to our use case in LinkedIn, we have such variety of use cases. It's not a single page for us. We have like six or seven big apps, different domains. One is very consumer focused um, uh, app, and then we have a very you know recruiter and enterprise focused app. And we have like diff and then we have the mobile app. We have different kind of um, requirements for each of them. And I think we chose. Less logic. I mean, that's what we call. We do use helpers to kind of do logic, but mostly rendering logic and not like business logic. But trust me, it's a lot much better than writing a JSP or a URB where you can actually clunk in any kind of you know Ruby controller code or um, and a JSP controller code that. That's basically with this. So so this is new. A lot of you know startups and a lot of like small small companies want to use it and they use it. But for us, I think as a company, we have so much infrastructure that we've built even with presentation. None of the stuff like you know, localization and IET and how would you do with this client rendered template was clear. Uh, there was no out of the box solution. And it's good to say that we're going to do client rendering of templates. But when you have like scaling and all, all the requirements of SEO, and, and, and sometimes you, you won't believe LinkedIn has good amount of like five, five to six percent of no JavaScript users that we still want to support because you know some of the products are enterprise. So we just can't say that we're going to do client side rendering all the, all the way. So, so those were some of the challenges you had to take care of. So typically this is, in a core example, it's too small, but I'm sure like most of you know about what it basically is. You know, you have JSON as a data and you write a dust template, which is kind of the same as mustache syntax. It has a single curly brace instead of a double curly brace. It is support for a lot of templating constructs that other languages have. Um, and, and that's something that I'll uh, go through a little bit. The, but the good things is like it's quite simple for simple things. Um, no one really needs to understand all these complex helpers and everything that I talk through to write a simple page. Um, it's, it's, uh, it's on GitHub and it's open source. It was written by um, a person and, then I, and, and that one person basically built the whole thing. And it supports a lot of good things about you know you, you know reusable markup you could write you could write you know the concept of being dry and not writing the same thing again and again. Um, they're called partials, and you can do conditions and you can actually do loops inbuilt into it. So we didn't have to really extend too much of it. Um, there's concept of usually when you have views, it looks really simple for simple cases, but there's a lot of reusability aspect comes in. You have to have you know some way to inherit an existing template or uh, and, and use some of the stuff that it already does and override a few things. All of these things are you know, pretty good in, in this templating language that we use called Dust. And that's a, uh, that's a code snippet of actually basically looping through a list of you know, people in the, in the JSON and, and calling another a partial. Um, I don't know if people notice on LinkedIn.com, um, every single profile has uh, a, a small icon in the top that kind of tells whether is your um, first degree or a second degree connection or is he not connected to you. And, and, and that, Small piece of thing is used across in every single uh, LinkedIn page where the profile it, uh, is shown, be it on the search listings or the actual profile listings. Um, things like that, I think we want to do it once. And, and, and that kind of support we look for in a templating language where you, know, you can dynamically kind of figure out. So distance there, if you look at that, that syntax, is basically distance is coming from JSON. And um, based on the distance values in LinkedIn, it be a 0, 1, or 2. You can actually um, have one place where you write these shared uh, piece of components, and then you can include. So that allows that by default, and we didn't have to do too much work, and then we chose it, and that's worked great for us. Second thing is, I think this is a debate about logic versus logicless. Um, I think we settle down between the two, and we call it less logic. Uh, we try to do very minimalistic logic. 
But there are cases where sometimes you want to, based on the data, you want to like have a certain CSS class selector uh, rendered. This is not something that we think should be done on the, on the server or on the controller, uh, because the data that comes down from the controller is very pure, um, could be adapted to a mobile template, could be adapted to a web template, could be adapted to another device template. So we really do not want such kind of data coming from a controller or have even logic in the controller that does this. So we chose to write a few helpers, which are like basic logic. You know, you can check if it's, so here is a simple, a simple thing that I just cooked up. <coughs> what it does is, um, I think based on the distance value in the JSON, uh, it's printing out an IHNized or, or, or like a localized text. Uh, if, the, if the value is less than or equal to one, it kind of prints your first degree, and if it's greater than one, it just prints as your second degree. And you'll see these um, at syntax all over in the templates that basically are JavaScript helpers. And you can run them on the client. I mean, as the template renders, this is another piece of JavaScript code. You can, you can write anything that you can write in JavaScript. So this gives full control to the actual developer to kind of build their own you know, library of what they want to do, like a helper library or a formatting library. And we have tried to restrict it to the minimum most, again, you know, to make it so that we don't have one-off helpers uh, in the whole site and, and create a lot of confusion. So some of the things that here, again, you, know, you want to have, render a form so you can create a nice helper tag and dust, and then basically everybody uses that, and then they don't redo the same thing again and again just to uh, 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 render a form and, and, and uh, some of the stuff that have to happen with the form. And, and this is very clean to me because you know, there's not much, there is very minimalistic logic, and it is devoid of any server-side logic or any kind of uh, you know, language-specific um, uh, thing. And this is, this is where we are. And to me, these helpers um, kind of be, you know, since you're playing JavaScript, as I told you in the beginning, there are cases where we want to really render the same template, the same helper on the, on the server. I mean, because it may be an SEO page um, something like a public you know, page, um, render, uh, written ones can be rendered on the server too. Since this is all JavaScript, if you have a very high performing JavaScript engine running on the server, you can just render the same template and just shove out HTML down the wire and then it just works. And, and then that's, that's, that's basically a strategy being. Um, and we've rolled it out to a lot of apps in LinkedIn. Um, they, and, 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 uh, there are some out there already in production and some in, in, the, in the process of building it. And I think in the beginning when we set out, there was a lot of you know, uh, hesitation and whether something like this, as simple as this, can really help the six years of work that LinkedIn has done in building the presentation infrastructure using you know, JSPs or ERBs and, and, and other um, um, server-side languages. But in theory, actually, that was, that was proved wrong. And I think we've been using it. And it sufficiently scales and, and works really well. I mean, um, some of the views that we have is really clean, and it does what it's supposed to do. So this is the next slide I want to move on. I mean, everybody talks about client rendering, client rendering, client rendering. It's not always true. I mean, um, not every use case that we have in such a big company can always categorized as a client rendered thing. And I've been talking through my talk a little bit of what are those use cases. Like, you know, you can have an SEO page and, and a, a non-JS client that you want to support. Um, but there are also other cases where I think with the biggest thing that uh, comes with um, Dust as a templating language is you can always pre-compile it into JavaScript on the server. What we've seen is almost like a you know, 10x difference if you try to compile the whole thing on the browser and then try to render it. It's a huge difference. So Dust came off the boat with this pre-compilation step that we do at, you know, at build time. And we send these templates onto the CDN. They're cached. They're, if you can look at the source code of it, it's basically a um, anonymous JavaScript function that kind of has converted your template into a, a, a JavaScript, multiple JavaScript calls. So when rendering happens on the client, it's basically executing JavaScript. So it's, it's pretty clean. It's, so someone writes a template like in the language, and then it gets compiled into a, a JavaScript, and then you CD and cache it. And then we don't even inline those templates in the, in the page. We benefit from actually caching every single template um, uh, inside it. Second, second thing is, um, why do we don't do everything on the client? These are some of the questions we, 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 we stumbled upon as we started rolling this out to a um, lot of features and, and using it widely in LinkedIn. Most often, a simple use case, you may not even have a sub-template or a sub-template sub in, in Dust is called a partial. You know, very simple. You have um, a loop. You, you know, most, most of the code examples that actually have on the site are very simple. You have a loop. You list through them. And then you have a condition. You check them. And then you write them. It doesn't really that 
a real use case? No. In real use cases, you have so much stuff that goes on. And it's nice to structure them out into you know, reusable stuff. But the biggest thing is you know, when someone tries to render them, they have to manually have this process of including every single template and every single template within that template that they need to render. That kind of thing is, again, you know, hinders the productivity or even like, you know, makes, them, makes it much clunkier for a developer to understand you know, what are the t different templates that I have to download to even render this on the client. And doing all that in line on a page means you're doing it while rendering. And again, it, 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 hinders, um, 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 it hinders a lot of um, you know, uh, site performance. And there, there are cases you can lazy load them. But not always. When you're trying to render a page that you want to immediately show something and, and, and not wait for another fetch of that template to be um, uh, done on the fly, uh, you want to think about that. So we do do certain things like this on the server. Um, and I think I'll talk about uh, briefly about the solution and what we do. So this is another use case where you know, even with client rendering, you may have to do things on the server. So another important thing that also we came across was, um, uh, before I get into this use case, I'll talk about how we solve the problem of uh, you know, trying to do this on the server. Um, Dust is a PEG.js grammar. It's a very simple, freakingly simple grammar. Um, it's super, super easy. And all it does is basically exposes you in a way to you know, write a, 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 a visitor pattern that you can you know, build an AST and then walk through the AST and do whatever you want. You can kind of visit every node, be it a, a block node or a partial node or, 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 or another reference node. It's super simple. So what we basically ended up doing is, using it not just for rendering, but also for pre-processing. So we write our own um, uh, walker that real time walks through, figures out the dependencies of the templates, and then gives them, but before the page is actually uh, sent down um, into, into, the, into the browser, we also send it down a list of templates that it includes, and then you know, boom, you download them way before the template starts rendering. So this kind of uh, a simplicity in our grammar that you can actually write another visitor or a walker and, and get an AST out of it, and, and pre-process them gives us huge benefits on trying to do some things that you don't want to do on the client. Uh, client rendering is good, but certain kind of pre-processing is good to be done before, um, mostly because you don't know what kind of client you're serving to. We serve a lot of IE7, IE8 clients, trust me. And those browsers may not be even good at you know, doing client rendering. So these are the things that allow us to actually control at what point we um, do client and what point uh, we can actually uh, help the client rendering to be faster. Another important thing, I think um, most often like you know, simpler sites have very let, uh, less emphasis on localization and formatting, but we call ourselves the professional network and I think we do seriously um, um, uh, have to consider someone's you know, professional name and there's certain languages that we support like in, in, in a Japanese and Korean and, and, and other languages that we're trying to support. Formatting is a big deal, and we have our own in-house you know, library that we do. Um, and and some, some of the reasons are very, you know, very, um, uh, uh, a very privacy, privacy thing as well. There are certain rules that we try to you know, uh, uh, hide certain you know, last names, and, and, and it brings us in a lot of money. So we can't take some of this logic that we have and put it down the client. The biggest Hurdle for us is we just can't expose some of these you know, custom logic that we have to do these things. So in a simple way, a, a, form, I mean, all, 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 a simple example that I'm trying to give you is all you want to do is format a name, a LinkedIn name. Seems very straightforward. You have a first name, last name, and you could do something in a JavaScript in 10 lines, download it, and then be done. But in LinkedIn, it's a little more complicated than 10 lines. You have 21 different languages or more. Um, and there are certain kind of business rules sometimes that apply when even formatting a name. Um, do we shove all of this down to the browser? I don't think it was a choice that we could do. Uh, we may at some point, but uh, at this point we couldn't. So these are some of the other use cases where we can pre-process this template that we have because we have the grammar, we have the AST that we can build in. Kind of replace, um, so, so we still build all of these as tags. So as an end user, like a developer or who's trying to build this template is agnostic of what's going on. So, so if you look at that uh, example there, I don't know if it's clear, it's basically a formatter tag that we come up with. It's, it's, it's a helper, but right now, it, in, in this case, if it's prefixed with an SS, it's a server-side processed helper. It's not a client-executed helper. So we just namespace these helpers, and we have a bunch of them that basically do all the processing of that data, and then create something that we came up with as like template-driven contextual JSON. So there is the raw 
data that the services usually send. For instance, if I am the LinkedIn profile, my first name is Vina, and my last name is whatever. Um, and then I have a bunch of other raw data that you know, comes back from the service. Along with that, they actually want my formatted name, and they want an i8 in a localized string. They, they want to display a bunch of other derived data. So for all of that that we really can't do on the client, which for some, as I said, for reasons explained, um, we try to do it very seamlessly. So a developer still writes a tag as it is, and we process them and insert that formatted name into the context that they've defined in. So in this case, it's an array of people, and I think there are two entries here, uh, one's Joe and Jade. And Joe and Jade came back as raw data, as, but the, the, the one that's highlighted in blue is something that we processed on the way back. It's like an you know, intercept your uh, data that's coming back from your control, like your Ruby app or your, um, I know, your Java app, and then you insert this additional library data into it, and then you send it back. So you're basically avoiding a lot of rendering and like the helper processing on the, on the client for certain clients that don't have so much bandwidth to render and then the JavaScript engine is slow. We, can, we, can, we, usually, we usually, uh, hugely benefit from this kind of thing. So again, uh, to us, since the whole grammar was open source and everything, writing something was, like this was pretty trivial. So last part, as I said, um, we, um, before we move into the, the, the last slide, as I said, we have a lot of use cases. We have SEO, we have certain payment processing pages that LinkedIn uses. They're pretty skeptical of using client rendering because this, this, the downside of client rendering is good that you can do all in the browser, but there's very minimal tracking that you could actually do. You know, what happened in uh, Brazil or what happened in uh, China, uh, whether the page really got rendered, was there a JavaScript thing, or is the site performance bad? It's hard to track these kind of things. Um, and it's those are kind of pages, so those are kind of use cases I think we kind of outright say, no, we want server-side rendering. But since we said that we're going to write these templates once, we did not want developers to learn three different kinds of templating languages, right? One that renders on the server, one that renders on the client. So we ended up integrating um, a V8, which is the nodes um, or the Chrome browser's JavaScript engine, which is pretty, pretty good. And we do server-side rendering when we, it's, when we have these use cases. Um, Certain cases, as I talked about, is like there's no JavaScript. You basically um, do a no script and then you redirect and then um, send it back to the proxy. So let me go back to the ne next slide, which actually is a minimalistic, you know, end-to-end -end diagram of the what, what our uh, front-end architecture today is. Um, and the the UI JSON aggregator slash V8 is the one that actually um, renders the same template. Um, so a template basically, or a LinkedIn page, um, has a bunch of these modules that are reusable. So you know, something like Profile can develop a lot of these modules that could be reused on homepage or reused on the recruiter product. And those templates are kind of aggregated together by this unit that sits in front of all of these front ends. So if you remember my few slides back, I was basically having JRuby and Grails and Node. Um, currently, it's not in front of Node, but other apps, we're trying to use this where you give this once. You, you know, if, if, if an app decides to do a full server-side rendering, you can actually use a V8 engine and render the whole template and shove HTML into it. And there may be reasons where improve where we have low bandwidth. We can determine whether the latency is really bad or the bandwidth is bad. Then we automatically revert back to server-side rendering um, and not wait for the client rendering to happen. So that, that is the unit we're working actively on that gives us these kind of benefits uh, once for all the LinkedIn. Uh, at some point, maybe even for uh, mobile. Because all of the mobile today that we have in LinkedIn is very up, and they are web code only, and then it's predictable and, and, and stuff. But I think down the line, if you move more to HTML5, and then we also support non-smartphones, there are always cases like that you, we want to take care of with the right here. And as I said, we have one repository that kind of serves our templates, and that's where you know sometimes when you have to server side runner, you talk to that the system that stores these static assets and then renders them on the uh, server and, and, and shoves them back. So this, this is pretty much what you're doing at LinkedIn at this point. Um, and I think this is a system we're trying to evolve and kind of even the, the V8 um, um, engine is a plug-in to one of the really high performance uh, a proxy that we use. It's a reverse proxy called ATS, which is a developer of Apache, uh, I think Yahoo, it's an Apache project called Apache Traffic Server. So we use that because I think a lot of in-house expertise exists. And we just kind of integrated into that C++ engine. Um, so that's another module that's open source for anyone to use who use ATS. And lastly, um, there are a lot of pages. This is one sample page that if you go to LinkedIn.com, people, which actually shows you 
a list of people you may know uses this at this point. We use Dust and templates and you know JSON and rendering. Um, and fact that this is, this is my last slide, and uh, I just want to conclude. We actually do a lot of Dust. Uh, I mean, we, it came as a started as a prototype, and then I think a lot, a lot, a lot of the teams in the in the company have embraced this, and it's given a huge productivity boost because. The biggest gains that I think I want to highlight at the end of it is um, we have a, a web dev community that we do front end stuff, basically develop features. They were very much reliant on a server side technology, like they had to know Java or they had to know Rails or like, you know, they had to know some kind of language to even like finish up the end to end product. Um, today, all we have is uh, support for like building the whole JSON using mocks. Uh, so we build mock JSON, we build these um, templates, and, and then actually, Build an end-to-end -end feature on the on, on on the app without really having a dependency on the back-end engineers, and that's where I think our major goal was to begin with in the in the in the, in the last year is how uh, do we really improve developer velocity at LinkedIn um, and make it pretty seamless and 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 try to use as much less uh, proprietary LinkedIn you know technologies for doing that um, and. Unfortunately, the person who developed DOS, we love it, we're using it, and we've done a lot of it, is not accepting you know, you know, pull requests. So we went out, and then we forked ours, and we maintained a fork. Um, I think we were collaborating with uh, PayPal. Um, and we went there, and we spoke. So I think we're trying to actually um, see if we can have a broader community embrace this. Uh, because compared to small startups, I think LinkedIn and, and PayPal are like companies that have huge legacy built into them to actually embrace something like this new and uh, also make it just work like they worked with the older technologies. Um, and we have a couple other things since we moved a lot to JavaScript templates. Um, similar to like, you know, the uh, backbone we have, uh, we're trying to, again, it's all on GitHub. It's called Lou. Uh, it's like the, um, um, another framework we're developing for event -driven, um, handling event-driven controls on the uh, thing, which I don't personally am part of it, but I just want to put it as a plug that you know, this is something we're doing. And, and we also have the dependency management thing. I think I heard a nice talk about Raptor in the morning. With similar kind of thing doing with LinkedIn too. So the idea being is to move more to the browser and then be very smart about uh, when we render on the browser. And, and that's, that's my talk. How do you detect SEO requests? So certain uh, pages, I think we are predetermined because we know it's basically an SEO page. We have like, you know, certain uh, um, apps already configured to say this is an SEO page. Um, and otherwise, if you don't have a user agent, you basically do a redirect and try to render them. But most, most of the SEO pages, we pretty much know that it is supposed to be a, you know, a crawled page. So we uh, pre-configure them to do server-side rendering. So you have a separate SEO page for the user screen? Uh, not exactly. So it's the same template. So that was the whole idea of write once and you know, render either on the client or the server. So if you pre-configured your particular app or page to um, have SEO requirements, then we never try to client render that whole uh, page. We always render it on the server and send HTML back to the bot or um, any of the you know, engines that are How crawling. How do you when a user client renders server render if you don't know the, who's calling it? Um, as I said, some of our pages are very predetermined. So we have uh, very public pages, like the LinkedIn profile has a LinkedIn profile page. But as I talked about, there are reusable markup that you can write, right? I mean, you can use the same reusable stuff in a, in, a, in a public profile page as well as um, a non-public profile page. There is code sharing. And the question is, a bot can request your non-profile page as well. Uh, they can request your other page as well. Oh, I, I, I don't think every single page we care about crawling. I mean, I mean they could. It doesn't really affect our um, what numbers, I guess, yeah. I understand. Yeah, I think so. So we try to limit those helpers. I think that's where you're coming and talking about helpers that we use for certain kind of rendering logic. Um, um, Not only that, but just to, you know, you have a snippet of a bunch of you know, UI elements that you're trying to pop into the page. I mean, there's a page, um, I mean, like a reflow happening, you're saying? Reflow is, uh, you could have a listed search for something, and then you have like 100 pixels. 
So, so again, a lot of that is uh, kind of configurable and when you kind of embed these things, whether you have above the fold elements that you don't want to like break them into multiple modules. So it's, a, it's something that we can render right there and send the above the fold stuff server side rendered. But below the fold stuff, sometimes like the infinite scrolling we have on pages may not be a case for server side rendering. So we try to see how much of that can be um, um, managed between server and client. Declaratively say sometimes that yeah part of this page you know there's it's a, it's a big spec that we have it's it's again a part of the um, page that you write you can say a certain markup is server side rendered uh, so that kind of gives the proxy server that we had in the in the thing a directive saying that I'm going to pre-render this and send it rather than trying to render it on the client if performance is, is a reason to do that. We, we are. So, so that's the part that I was talking of. Um, our APIs, we want to use internal and external APIs the same. So our external APIs don't give all this formatted data on the, like date formats and time formats are never done there. Um, I don't know if I'm... Um, the, the actual client itself, like the actual making the HTTP request to get the data and then passing that to the template. You want to you normalize the template part, the view part, and then the other part of actually getting the data and the controller, uh, did you normalize that as well across the two environments? You mean across the two when you say to the server and, and, and the browser? Um, it's actually the same. I mean, why would it be different between the server and the, and the client? Can you t can you talk about our use case? So if you uh, have an API that you want to make a call to get some data, if you're in the node, you don't use necessarily XML HTTP request to get the data. You might use some, a different API. You might use the native HTTP object. And then in the browser, you do use XML HTTP request. So did you just create wrappers around those different? Um, so I think one thing that's kind of, kind of not very clear is this the UI aggregator that we have. Uh, we really don't make XML HTTP requests to render these modules on the page. Um, the, 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 the proxy that it sits in front is kind of doing internal data center calls. Um, so it's not from the browser. It's not from an XML HTTP request they're making. Uh, but, but certainly there may be cases where, you know, between like an AJAX call or a XML HTTP request to the, the, the base page to be rendered, um, there are differences. And I think that's more handled on the controller. I don't think we have like solved it in a very frameworkish way. No. Um, so they're all on the Firebug console output. So it's basically, as I said, they get pre-compiled into JavaScript. So if there is a syntax error while compiling, we have tools to do that while on development. You know, you can gives you it gives you a good error reporting what line number and what syntax is wrong. Um, but on the, on the runtime, if there's really something wrong, it's just a JavaScript error. So that's the side effect of like using JavaScript. You have to be like really testing it. So it blocks the rendering of the entire page if there is one single error at the top. These templates, as I said, they're very forgiving. If the data exists, they render. I think that's the concept of all logicless templates. If the data exists, they render. If the data doesn't exist, they don't render. Um, that's the part, as I said, it's hard to do client-side tracking in those cases. Um, so good testing around it. Mock JSON helps us to kind of build good test fixtures on different kinds of data. I guess the point that you're trying to make is what you write is what you learn about. It's, it's a compiled template is the same as what you wrote. It's just the JSON that's kind of augmented. So um, maybe it's, it's not clear. So we don't really change. We just does, allows you to write a template and, and kind of converts into a JavaScript just for performance. So nobody can really look at the, the I mean, you mean to say is it hard to debug the JavaScript thing? No, I'm not saying that. Uh, what I'm saying is that you write some code. When you're actually debugging it on the, on the web page, you're actually debugging it on the code. It's a compiled code. Yeah, it's a compiled yeah. JavaScript. Yeah. And, and most, most, most of the time, we haven't seen that because, as I said, um, it hasn't been a big concern because most people who develop are very JavaScript friendly and web developers are. And um, the exception handling and, and it's, and it's very forgiving. And, and I, I, we haven't seen a use case where people complain about that hugely. Yeah, I'll take the, that person because I know he's like hugely hates logic uh, templates.
So we so, so basically we test it on the browser. So that means our pages automatically download this library of helpers that we have at the top way b before any rendering happens. Yeah, so that's part of the framework that the bootstrap <coughs> data that we have has these helpers and, um, and the basic bootstrapping we need to render. Yeah, it's sometimes through a header, yeah. control through a header or a URL parameter, like you have a page. We use a simple thing on mock <laughs> equals a mock header. Yeah, because you're not waiting for the entire service to be ready to actually even build the end-to-end -end feature. Um, the two things that I could answer here, it's um, one thing it's Dust came with that helper, so it's in built into Dust, there are certain helpers, so I would say it's not a new language, but I agree that the fact that we want it to be logicless and we're adding these helpers to do, I think it was just a bridge you had to, or it's a marriage of things that you have to, usually every use case doesn't fall into um, pure logicless. Um, for instance, there are applications that write using Node, and they do some of this data munching right in the Node, and then give back a very usable JSON. Um, for them, it doesn't really make sense to use this kind on the template. Um, if you're not working in a job, so I mean, we, we're talking more about developer velocity and not to depend on certain people. Um, as I said, the mock JSON has really helped us and tried to reduce this kind of logic. Um, there's a use case where somebody had to wait for an engineer to write an endpoint that gave them the kind of JSON they wanted. Now with mock, they actually do that by themselves and tell them, actually, I wanted a way to you know, um, um, send you the first degree or the second degree right there in the template, not kind of render it here. So um, this, this, there is, I think it's hard, as I've seen in the, in the company rolling this out, I think it's hard to have one ideology of like, let's do logicless. I think there are a lot of people who want to bridge that. I agree. I don't believe in logicless either. I think you do need that. I guess I'm just wondering that, like, what if you now come, I say, I want to do Less than one or greater than two, and now you, it doesn't work anymore. So. Oh, we have a helper for that called if, where you can actually evaluate okay. an expression. Okay. <laughs> um, yeah, there is, you can check out our LinkedIn um, Dust uh, extension site here, um, GitHub LinkedIn Dust.js. We do have all that open source. All the helpers that we use internally are right there. Um, It's a pull request. I mean, we usually have a separate file. We don't pull into every single helper that anybody contributes into our LinkedIn base. But if it's really useful, we do. The one thing I think Jason did do well. You guys can chat. We'll chat later. Okay. <laughs> Sorry, guys. <laughs> you should come work at LinkedIn. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you, guys, for um, letting us come and talk here.